back to biology um, after quite a few talks on modeling and physics. And uh, Olivia has really made my job easy for, uh, by introducing the plant system. He told us the plants are stressed. He, in fact, told us all of us are stressed. We are. Um, but uh, that's good because the stress uh, actually eventually helps the plant grow to a specific shape and size of the plant organ and the whole plant. What I'm going to talk about is take leaf as a model system and discuss about how leaves grow and what are the growth rules that the leaf follows and their diversity of that. I'm not going to talk much about mathematics or physics, but it's totally biology. Maybe a little bit of uh, allometric uh, equations will be there. So this is a mature leaf taken from a species called snapdragon. And as you see, this has a lovely shape. I say this, uh, it has a lovely and beautiful shape because the shape is um, quite uh, you know, predictable in the sense it follows some sort of mathematical rules. It's almost elliptical. And when it's elliptical, you know that you have a major axis, a minor axis, and if you know them, then you can actually predict their area and then uh, circumference and so on and so forth. Because of this predictable nature, uh, or mathematical shape, it is very beautiful, and it uh, almost you know as beautiful as the canon of proportions that uh, Leonardo da Vinci uh, painted uh, in his Vitruvian Man. So this leaf uh, did not uh, originate as uh, you know uh, of the shape and size. Uh, they originate at the very tip of the plant that Olivier had shown you. If you take the above ground part of the plant, remove all the leaves, go to the all the way to the tip and take a picture in a scanning electron micrograph, you know, ma magnify by, say, a few hundred times, uh, you will see a structure like this. Uh, and you have already been introduced to this one. This is a shoot apical meristem. All the uh, cells here look pretty simil similar uh, or homogeneous, but they are not. Uh, different regions have taken different decisions. For example, this is a very young leaf primordium. The leaf primordium that you are seeing here, this is the oldest one. Next one was made here, next one was here, and here, and here, and here. They follow a lovely spiral pattern with a very specific angle in between, which is the golden angle or 137 degrees, which is, comes from the Fibonacci series of ratio. So these are the leaf primordia. They are starting their life. Uh, where did they originate from? Whatever the remaining of the leaf, uh, the, the cells that is remaining here, those are the stem cells. These stem cells remain stem cells for the life of the plant. Unlike animal, where the, all the patterning happens in the early stage of the life and then after that only growth, uh, in plant the patterning goes on throughout the life of the plant. So this will maintain, the green will maintain greenness throughout the life of the plant. This uh, leaf primordium, which has just started its life, will finally grow, go through a process of growth, and then make a structure like this. And if you compare, uh, th if this is about, say, 50 micron long, and this is about seven, you know, 70 millimeter long, it has grown uh, in one dimension at least you know, 1,500 times. So you can imagine in volume, it will be much more, it's a three order of magnitude. The question is how a structure like this uh, grows to a shape and size like this, generation after generation. So there are genetic controls of that. To know how it grows, what you have to do is you have to photograph uh, at different growth stages. For example, this is a tiny leaf about two millimeter long and you photograph at different stages and this is the final. This leaf will stay on the plant for another three months and do its job, which is photosynthesis and other things. However, this 10 to 12 days of uh, activities in the early life is where the leaf is being formed and that is the happening form of the leaf or the growth stage of the leaf. This is what we are interested in. If you look at these structures, uh, you will see that an early leaf, for example, somewhere here, has pretty similar shape as the leaf which is mature. So what is happening is, is, the, is, is increasing by size, but the shape is not really changing much, at least uh, you know, for the best part of the, of the growth of, of leaf. So if you take these two leaves and put this together and ask the question, how does the leaf grow? What, because the shape is not changing, your intuitive answer will be that it is growing uniformly. That is, every region of the, uh, or domain of the leaf is growing at the same rate, and, the, and that's where the shape is not changing, unless only the size is changing. However, I can also argue that the leaf is not growing throughout its uh, expanse, but is only growing from the, peri uh, from the periphery. 
then also you can get a structure like that, right? So basically from this structure to this structure, we have more than one ways of arriving at this structure from, from this structure. So how do you study how it grows? What you can do is, you can do a very uh, crude and simple experiment. Since different regions you cannot differentiate from one from the other because it's a homogeneous field, you can put some dots which you can follow in the track with time. What you do is you take a young leaf and then which is still stuck to the plant and put some dots there because there are no dots. If there are, you know, naturally dots, you don't have to put the dots. And then if it is growing uniformly at the end of the growth, you will see, uh, you will expect that all the dots are spread out. It's just like a spotted balloon. As you are inflating the balloon, the spots go away from each other. Right? Should mention here that unlike animal, the cell migration is totally absent from the plant kingdom. There is no cells, and uh, Olivier has uh, explained why there is no cell migration probably, because it has a very strong cell wall, which is inflexible, and that doesn't even allow the cell to turn and twist. That is very different from, and, uh, from animal system. And cells usually do not die through a programmed cell death during the development. Or rather, I would, uh, you know, rephrase, the programmed cell death has very little role in plant development. Not that it doesn't have at all. For example, in the xylem, making the xylem column, the cells die. But uh, usually it is not. So the two of the developmental mechanisms, cell migration and cell death, which is very important for, for animal, is absent from the plant. So the cell division and cell expansion, uh, again, which he has uh, explained, is the major uh, processes which uh, control the plant, plant growth. So you do the experiment. Uh, so, so if it is growing uniformly, this is what you expect. But if the second possibility is correct, that it grows only from the periphery, you will see the dots will stay where they are, right? They will not really move. You can do this experiment because cells don't migrate. If the cells migrated, then your dot also will move along with the cell. To do the experiment, this leaf is still a young leaf, about 13 millimeter long and still stuck to the plant. Only out of a Photoshop has been used to cut it. Uh, and, uh, and then let it grow. Once it matures, it will grow, uh, the same leaf will grow up 66 millimeter in this case. This is the same leaf which is spotted here as the young and this is the, uh, the bigger leaf. I'll just normalize the size so that you can see it. This is the young uh, leaf and this is the, uh, the, the, the same leaf at the end of the growth. What you see here is the dots which is throughout the leaf is collected only towards the tip of the plant. It essentially means that growth is not uniform. The growth, the majority of the growth has happened from the base of the leaf because this, uh, so this is the, uh, uh, the lowest, you know, the, this spot here which has gone somewhere there. So this much of the growth has come from this, this tiny region. So it is, it is not uniform growth. And if you follow all the dots here, which is, probably, you know, equidistant, and here you can see they are not, their distance is more here than here than here than here, and there's a lot of crowding in this one. So essentially what it means is empirically you can say that there is a growth gradient. It may be linear gradient, may not be, most likely it's non-linear gradient, but there's a gradient. There's more growth here, and there's, there's a less growth here. Now, when you, I said growth, I really you know, didn't consider whether the cells are dividing or cells are expanding. I only consider that there is a, 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 a field, you know, a two-dimensional field which is expanding. But uh, leaves are, you know, made of cells. And uh, usually most of the growth is uh, driven by the cell division. Cell expansion also, of course, you know, contributes to the, to the leaf, the lamina expansion. But it's the cell division which is. So if there is more growth here, that should be reflect, reflected in the cellular uh, uh, characteristic as well. For example, cells here should be, you know, different from the cells here because this is a dividing region and this is a growing region, this is a not, not growing region. So if you uh, take a closer look at uh, a leaf where, which is young and growing and see the epidermal cells of, uh, of this leaf, you will see that, that the cells are really very different. So these cells here are very small. Uh, average uh, area is uh, given here, about 100 square micron. And they are dividing. You can see that, you know, they're, you know the division furrow uh, in between. The cells here are much bigger. They have started expanding because the mature cells are squiggly and, uh, you know, jigsaw shaped. And you can see that the cell differentiation also taken place. These are stomata. And uh, this will, you know, further grow uh, and become up to about 10,000 square micron. And the cells in between is uh, somewhere in the, you know, uh, in between uh, differentiation stage. This is the stomata in the process of being uh, uh, differentiated. And the size also is somewhere in between. So essentially what you have is you have an opposite gradient of differentiation, more growth here, 
least growth year and more, most develop, uh, differentiation year least development because they are uh, anyway opposite of each other. And that is reflected in the, cell, in the gene expression as well. Since these uh, cells are dividing, the genes that are required for the cell division also has a gradient of expression. For example, if you take a transgenic uh, arbidopsis leaf where the B cyclin is marked with the color producing uh, gene, uh, this is a tiny leaf. Uh, I'll probably normalize it so you can see. This is a tiny leaf uh, where you can see there is uh, the each dot represents a cell which is expressing the B cyclin, which is expressed in the uh, division S phase. Uh, so you can uh, see that there is more uh, B cyclin here and there's a list here. At a little later stage, the B cyclin is restricted in, in the base, but from the top it is cleared out. So basically, what is happening is the cyclin is being cleared out from the top. And this is the region which will have the cell cycle activity for the longest duration. This is the region which will have the cell cycle activity for the least duration. And uh, it's a dynamic process, basically. So now, if you uh, put all these uh, data together, uh, that is the spotting experiment, the, uh, the cell size, and the, the gene expression data, all it tells that it is not a, uh, you know, equal growth. It's not, yeah. Tell me. Right. So, uh, uh, I, uh, I mean, a lot of people have tried doing the experiment. Uh, if you uh, cut the leaf at a very early stage, in fact, uh, Enrico Cohen in uh, John Innes, he has cut it to the laser ablation take at the very uh, early stage and take the top half off. Uh, the leaf grows to maturity as if nothing has happened to the leaf. And that's mainly because the growth potential is at the, at the base. Yeah. And only at the tip, there's a tiny uh, you know, region which is missing. You can't even make out. Um, that is for this species. Uh, yeah, I mean, till the maturity, there is no, uh, I mean, it, it grows to the size, which is almost uh, as if you didn't cut it. So, that, and that's because, and it also tells that uh, actually the growth in this region is independent of the growth of, of the uh, other region. And uh, what Rico did is he measured the uh, growth rate and, uh, uh, you know, the direction and anisotropy in every region by, uh, 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 you know, like, uh, real-time measure, measurement, and then he showed that whether you cut it or not, the growth rate and other parameters remain same uh, in, the, in the basal region if you cut the top. So it, it's totally independent of each other. So if growth in one region is different from another region, uh, that traditionally has been called growth allometry. And I think allometry has been uh, discussed in the, uh, on the first day a little bit. And allometry uh, is a subject which uh, zoologists and botanists have been studying for probably 100, 150 years because it doesn't really need much. You have to just measure, you know, different regions of an, uh, an organism. A uh, traditional example of allometry is the fiddler crab, where when the crab is really small, male crab, when the male crab is really small, the, both the claws are of the same size, and then one claw starts, uh, uh, you know, growing at a much faster rate than the remaining of the body. So much so that at maturity, a single claw is bigger than the rest of the body. So, uh, uh, and this actually this, uh, helps in, uh, in, the, in the crab in uh, fighting with other crabs and also getting the, the females. And people have actually measured the extent of the allometry uh, in, in the fiddler crab, uh, growth allometry in the fiddler crab uh, and quantified it. So if you thought the sex apple cannot be quantified, that's not true. Uh, so, uh, so growth allometry can be measured as the growth of an organ for, uh, versus the rest of the body or within an organ, different regions as well. So since there is a growth difference in the different regions, you can measure the growth allometry in this, in this leaf. So if growth allometry, if you define is the growth relationship of one organ to the rest of the body, or uh, the growth uh, relationship of a part of the organ uh, uh, in relation to the rest of the organ. And uh, this was, uh, you know, it's there in all developmental biology books I've taken from Gilbert. Uh, the human baby, when, uh, She's uh, only eight week old in mother's womb. Uh, the head is almost half of the total uh, height. So, you know, 45 to 50%. And when she grows to maturity, the head is about 12 to 15, 15% of the total height. So uh, the children usually uh, explain this as uh, adults have smaller brain. I have no problem with that. But what it essentially means that the growth proportion of the body is more than the growth, growth proportion of the head. Our body grows at, at a faster rate than, than our head grows. So 
I mean, same for the leaf as well. We have seen that the leaf grows from the from the base than the, uh, the more at the base than the than the chip. So this uh, study has been done for uh, quite some time, but the, the first quantification of allometry was done by Julian Huxley, who uh, you know after uh, several excellent papers, uh, he wrote a book on problems in relative growth uh, and uh, explained the uh, how to quantify that. So what he did is, uh, I'm taking an example to tell. I'm not really saying that Huxley measured the, uh, you know, the, the fetus uh, size and all. Uh, so you measure the one part of the body, which you call X, as a function of developmental stages or as a function of time. You measure the rest of the body, which is called Y, as a function of the, of the development or time, and then plot them one against the other. So this is the trunk, Y, and this is the head, uh, which is X. We know that the body is growing more, so this is a non-linear relationship. So this is not a mathematical deduction, probably, it's just an empirical uh, you know, measurement. But here, the y is not proportional to x, but x to the power something, which is non-unity. If it's unity, of course, it will be a straight line, right? It will be an isometric. So y is proportional to x square alpha, where alpha is not 1. And we can very easily convert this one into y equal to you know, a par uh, constant into uh, x to the power alpha. And uh, for, the, for the sake of the easy measurement, you can take a double logarithm of this one, and then you'll get a straight line. Okay? So here you have y equal to mx plus c. And m, which is this alpha value, is the slope of this, of this line. Very easily, you can calculate the alpha value by taking a double log of this uh, set of data. Now, why are you doing this? Alpha will tell you the, the growth relationship or the extent of allometry, but it will tell you even more than that. Simply the value of the alpha will tell you more than that. And what is that? This is explained here. So when alpha is greater than 1, in this case, it will be called positive element. allometry. For human, it is 2.6. But in other words, when our head grows twice, our body grows 2 to the power 2.6. So alpha is 2.6. So if positive allometry when alpha is more than 1, this is the polarity of the growth. When the alpha is less than 1, it's called negative allometry, which means that the growth polarity is reversed. And when al alpha is 1, it's a special case of, case of allometry, which is isometry. There is no polarity at all. Okay? So it is growing synchronously. All the regions in this axis is growing syn synchronously. So if you can tell the polarity of the growth so easily, that is simply by taking some measurements and then plotting them and uh, finding out alpha value, uh, then you can uh, do that in you know different species and then find out the, uh, the, the diversity as well. But it's very easy to do it in human being because human being has a head, most of us, and uh, it has a, a trunk as well. So measure the two very easily. You know where to measure. But for a leaf, that's not very easy. So you can sort of uh, you know uh, create an artificial situation. This is a young leaf, and you, uh, along this proximal distal axis, you put a point in the center, and then say this is the head of the leaf, and this is the trunk of the leaf. So then, you know, it's easy to measure now. And usually, the good thing about working on plants is they don't object, like animal models. So uh, you, you have x here, and you have y here, and you, what you do is, uh, on day one, you measure x and y, which is x equal to y, and then keep measuring x and y as it grows. So what you will have is a set of x1, y1, x2, y2, or rather xi, yi set of data. And then you can very easily you know, plot them in double log and then find out what the alpha value is. And that the value of alpha will tell you whether it is uh, growing from which polarity. So what do you expect? You expect that one possibility is, this is the day one where you have put the dot here, this is the distal part and this is the proximal part of a young leaf. It is possible that this part will grow more and this x will grow less. This is positive allometry where alpha is more than 1. It is also possible, theoretically, that uh, this part will grow more and then y will grow less. That is, alpha is less than 1, which is uh, negative allometry. It's also possible that it will remain same as it is, and it's, it's isometric. There are three possibilities are there. And all the uh, leaves of a model system that uh, people have used, Arabidopsis, uh, maize, and uh, snapdragon, and so on and so forth, they always showed uh, positive allometry. But there is no real reason that why you know leaves should leave with, uh, uh, leaves, leaves should grow with positive allometry, unless there's a developmental constraint, of course. So uh, since you can measure the alpha value relatively easily, uh, you can do that for more than one species. For example, you can do that in 75 species, especially if you're in a campus like in ICTS or 
GKVK or IAC. Uh, uh, so these are the, uh, you know, uh, leaves. You just totally ignore what the shape is and whether it is uh, simple or compound and all. You just take leaves uh, and, and consider their proximal distal axis and then measure the alpha value. Um, when you plot the alpha values of, uh, you know, different leaf species, you see that many of them are, uh, you know, alpha value is positive. So this is the alpha value is one is marked here. And as long as it's more than one, you don't care how much it is, right? Two, three, four, it doesn't really matter. It tells you it's positive allometric. Except that four means is more allometric than two, but that it, as long as it's more than one, uh, one it tells you uh, polarity. And if it is more than one for these species, we'll call it positive allometry, and you know the alpha is more than one. But there are many species where statistically the alpha value is one you know, within the within the statistical distribution, uh, which uh, which means that these are don't have any growth allometry at all. They grow with isometry or in a synchronous way. But there are a few species where alpha value is less than one, uh, and uh, you call them negative allometry. And there is one species which is a little bit uh, difficult to measure the alpha value, and uh, I call it mixed allometry, but I'll come to that later. It's one or two species with that we have, we have found, but very few in abundance. So you uh, do have a diversity in terms of the growth polarity in, in, in leaf. So when we, you see that there are you know, four different groups, and these many individuals that you have measured, you try to put them and then see, is, what is the relationship? And are they related genetically? That is, uh, if you put them into the phylogenetic tree, it doesn't mean that it's following some sort of pattern. Or uh, is it, you know, depends on the environment, or the growth pattern, uh, growth ha uh, or environment, and so on and so forth. So when you try to put all these, you know, species into, uh, uh, and, uh, in, and try to group them, uh, in terms of allometry, this is the distribution. Uh, positive allometry is about half of them. Uh, out of the total 75, it includes uh, all sorts of plants. You know, it includes climbers, it includes annuals. You know what annuals are? They grow at the very basal level, and then within one uh, uh, season, it grows and dies. It has trees and shrubs, and then so on and so forth. About 40% is isometry, a small, small percent is negative allometry, and then, you know, uh, one or two percent is, is mixed allometry, which can come later. But if you, uh, you know, make a phylogenetic tree, you do see that some sort of pattern is, is uh, appearing. Uh, this is uh, probably the, uh, the most ancestral here is the magnolias. You see these green ones are the negative allometry. Okay? And these ones, blue ones, are the isometry and these are positive allometry. So it, it looks like that the older plants or ancestral plants uh, are, uh, uh, you know, negative uh, uh, leaves grew uh, negative allometry, and the later and more evolved one did not have the negative allometry at all. So it's possible that isometry, and especially positive allometry, are the more evolved, uh, you know, uh, uh, growth allometry uh, in, in leaves. But there is another, you know, uh, division which is quite interesting. For example, this is the total number of plants that, and, and the distribution in terms of their allometry, as I told before. And if you take the annuals, uh, you know, separate all the annuals from them. For example, these are, leave the perennials, about 50 perennials here. You see the distribution still stays, about 60% isometry, 25% positive allometry, negative allometry, mixed allometry or something. But the remaining, which is 25, which is annual, is uh, all of them are, are positive allometry. Okay, this is quite interesting and I have no answer, you know, uh, no explanation for that, why, why it is. The only thing is, you know, you can do some hand waving. Uh, annuals are uh, the plants which, um, grow at the ground level and usually they are eaten up by the grazing animals and botanists uh, tell us, which I am not one, uh, that annuals came later in, in evolution. Uh, the trees first and then shrubs and then annuals. So uh, the question is that why, you know, the annuals uh, uh, do have only one type of allometry and there is no diversity at all. One possibility is you have only 25 in number, you need much more, uh, uh, of course possible. Uh, but it's also uh, possible, you can think from this way, that annuals grow at the, you know, they, uh, uh, they have to grow fast. They are eaten up by grazing, uh, grazing animals, uh, much more chance than the trees and the, and the creepers and the shrubs. So uh, if the growth is with negative allometry, that is growth potential is at the tip, if the leaf is eaten up from the tip, top half, then it will not grow. Just the cutting experiment that, that, that you are asking. Whereas that is not the case if it's a positive allometry. Growth potential is at the, at the close to the plant, and even if it is eaten up half of it, that the 
the leaf can still grow and then the cutting experiments or the ablation experiment has shown that, that actually leaves can grow to the maturity with almost same size if you cut it really uh, early enough. So one possibility is the annuals probably had, so first of all there is no developmental constraint of growth polarity because it can grow with all sorts of polarity. But in annuals probably initially when the annuals appear, it's possible that they had all sorts of allometry, uh, growth allometry, but later on the, the, the positive allometry since it has an adaptive advantage, uh, only the positive allometry remained and others are wiped out. But that's only uh, you know, a, a possibility. So uh, now that we have you know, uh, four different types of allometries, you can you know, try and study a little bit uh, in detail uh, in terms of their cellular behavior, the cell division and cell expansion and see whether they match with the growth allometry or not because this is uh, solely based on the alpha value. So you take uh, uh, representative species from each group, group for example, say Nicosia and Antecoma from positive allometry and then you know, study that a little bit more detail. So this is a small uh, tobacco leaf where you have put the dots here and then this dot is at the center x equal to y and when it grows bigger you see y is more than x that is the positive allometry which I have shown before taking the snapdragon as a as an example. So this leaf grows more from the base and less from the top. For human being this is uh, alpha value is 2.6. What is the alpha value here? You can measure it very easily by plotting the x and y. And when you plot the x and y here, this is the x and this is the y, you can see that had it been uh, isometry, this would have been the graph, but it has deviated from here and this is the graph that you see. If you, uh, if you uh, uh, fit it to the uh, uh, power, power law or uh, elementary equation, you see the alpha value is 4.4. So this basically, uh, the, if the top half grows twice, the bottom half grows 2 to the power 4.4, alpha value is 2.4. Right, so, uh, th so this essentially means because alpha is more than one, it's growing more from here and less from here and that is reflected in the cell, uh, uh, in the cells as well. If you measure the cells here and cells here and cells here, what you see is these are small and these are bigger, already differentiated and this is somewhere in between. So there is a, you know, a, a, a polarity in terms of the cellular differentiation or behavior as well. So this is a one stage, right, is a frozen structure. If you do that at all developmental stages, you get a, a graph of something like that. So this is a leaf length or different developmental stages, the youngest leaf and the oldest leaf. You see to begin with all the cells of the same size in this along this axis. In the end also at maturity all the cells are sort of of the same size. What is happening is they are taking different, you know, uh, 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 different path in terms of their maturity. The tip cells which is uh, around uh, the circle here is maturing first and then uh, bottom cells are the basal cells are maturing last and this is somewhere in between. So uh, you have the, the polarity in this one. And uh, since these cells are dividing uh, more than compared to these cells, these are not stop dividing, you take a section in, and uh, you know stain with some nuclear uh, you know marker and you can see there are closely related uh, you know uh, packed cells and this is little uh, you know more fewer nuclei and this is fewer because they're bigger cells, yeah. Okay, okay, let me explain. I think part of it was explained by Olivier. So in terms of uh, the, when the cell cycle uh, goes on, the cells divide and goes through the M phase and later on when they have decided that enough is, uh, enough of division, they just keep the M and then keep on making the, you know, more and more DNA so that it expands without any uh, nuclear division. However, during the division also, see when you expand in terms of space, you have to grow in volume anyway. Whether you grow by division or grow by expansion, it doesn't matter, right? So majority of the growth happens. So there are two kinds of expansion happens. One is the mitotically related, I mean mitosis, mitosis dependent uh, uh, expansion. The other one is the mitosis or post mitotic expansion. The, the absolute expansion of space happens more through the cell division. What happens is this is a cell, it divides into two, grows to the double the size, each of them will divide again, each of them will grow again and divide again. So that growth is more than the growth that is driven by the cell, cell expansion. That was done by, as I mentioned about that Rico's uh, Enrico Coen's paper where he actually measured the growth in terms of the space rather than the cell irrespective of cell division. So expansion driven growth at the top is, uh, is lower than the, than, than the expression driven growth, uh, uh, division driven growth at the, at the base. 
and it's quite interesting and that's why uh, you know it makes leaf an interesting uh, uh, object to to study is at the same uh, 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 leaf you have a spatial distribution of the cell division and, and, and expansion so you can study both of them right so uh, if you uh, if you closely look at this nuclei some of them you'll see they're in the m phase i mean this is of course uh, uh, anaphase and if you count about say 1000 nuclei and see how many of them are in the m phase that percentage with, of that will tell you what is the mitotic index. This is measure the mitotic index here, here, and here, and you will see that mitotic index is more here than here and then here. So there is, you know, that the, the what you have seen that the, by alpha value that more growth here and less growth here is strongly correlated with the cell and the activity of the uh, of, of the cells or the division activity of the cells. Uh, wherever there is more growth, there is more uh, mitotic index. Again, this is uh, at a frozen state at one state. If you measure the mitotic index in these three uh, you know uh, places along the proximal distal axis at every developmental stage and plot them this is what they look so this is the youngest leaf and this is the oldest leaf and this is the mitotic index uh, uh, here at the tip which drops much earlier and then is zero here and this is the base which uh, you know is continues for a longer time so that so uh, all this you know uh, uh, tells that there is uh, so uh, tobacco growth with, grows with positive allometry and you know there's more growth at the, at the it's also called basic beta because more growth at the base and then less growth at, at the chip synonymous but uh, there are other groups for example if you take the hibiscus and then which has isometry or in other words alpha value, value is one uh, if, so this is a small hibiscus and this is a big hibiscus you have plotted, you know, spotted this one, the spots are uh, equally distributed even at the end of the growth as well, which tells you that this has, uh, uh, you know, isometry and there is no growth. It's a synchronous growth. So this is X and this is Y, uh, in, uh, and uh, at the end of the growth also the X equal to Y. Uh, this, uh, of course, does not happen for uh, human, otherwise you would have seen me in a different way. Uh, so, uh, so here the alpha value is expected to be one and uh, so this uh, circle is, had it been isometry, and this is the one, the actual one, and you can see this is the isometry, and after this point, and see through the steps. So this leaf does not grow like tobacco leaves. It does not have any polarity in, in the proximal distal axis. So this uh, is, uh, grows uh, isometrically. And the cells also behave the same way. If you measure the cell uh, size, you will see that uh, along this axis, the cell size is pretty, pretty similar not only at this stage, but at all the developmental stages. So this is the young leaf and this is the old leaf, and these are the cell sizes at, uh, you know, three spaces and sort of, you know, following the same uh, uh, same path. So this is a synchronous growth, and uh, the cells are also dividing uh, at the, uh, you know, synchronously. Uh, you take the sections and then find out the mitotic you know, index, which is pretty similar at this stage and at all stages. So this is uh, a young leaf and this is the old leaf, and you can see the mitotic index and three uh, different uh, positions are pretty you know, similar. So this has, uh, you know, you have a, a isometry. Uh, the third one, which does not have too many members in this uh, group, the codium, which is a croton, I'm sure you have in your garden as well, uh, has uh, uh, this one. This is a, a young croton leaf, and this is uh, which is same leaf which has grown. And here x equal to one, and the end of the growth, you see the x is more than the y. Um, so uh, again, uh, the croton can do that, we can't. And uh, uh, here the expected alpha value is uh, less than one and yes, it is, uh, it is 0 0.6. So the growth polarity is opposite of what you saw in tobacco. And uh, if you see the cell size, you see that they have started maturing from the base and as opposed to the tobacco that you see from the top. And this is still dividing. The mitotic index also have uh, the similar, for example, the mitotic index uh, uh, sorry, this is the cell site. The cells at the base, which is this one, it matures first, and this is the cells at the tip, which is, uh, which is opposite of tobacco. And mitotic index also has uh, opposite polarity. And if you measure the mitotic index at all developmental stages, uh, you see that uh, mitotic index drops uh, at the uh, first at the base and then and, and the tip. So you have these three different sort of uh, divergent uh, polarity of growth uh, in, 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 uh, in nature. Now, I told you that there is a strange species which showed some uh, mixed allometry, and this is what. So, uh, I called it mixed allometry because if you look at it, uh, the uh, um, chloroplast uh, development or the greening of the leaf 
is also linked to the development. More mature, more uh, green it will be. Looking at the greenness, you can make out that this maturing from here and maturing from here. So when you look at it, at the cell size, you see the cells are dividing in the, at the middle, but is maturing from uh, the two ends. So it is not a, uh, you know, a sing, you know, simple allometry, because to measure a simple allometry, you should have a directionality, you know, either this way or this way, or there is no, uh, no direction at all. But it has two directions. What is happening is, uh, if you mark the cells, bigger here, bigger here, and smaller here, and you can't really measure the, uh, the alpha value here. But again, you can, you know, make a, uh, artificial situation and say this is one leaf and this is another leaf, right? So this is a positive allometry because growth is at the base and this will be a negative allometry. I can measure separately, you know, break them into two. And you would expect it will be more than one and less than one, and yes it is. So this alpha value is 2.6 and this alpha value is, so that's why we called it a, a, a mixed allometry. So this leaf grows from the middle and not from the top or the bottom. So if you thought only human being grows from the middle, that's not correct. Even leaves also can grow from the middle. So you have this, you know, four, four different uh, uh, growth polarity. Uh, now the question is, um, you know, description is nice, but why? Okay. So you can think of some sort of differentiation-inducing molecule, which is differentially distributed in different types. Growth or cell division is uh, a default state. The beginning, you know, everybody is living, but on that is the initiation of the differentiation is more important. So you can uh, think of some red molecule uh, which is inducing differentiation and distributed, you know, differently. Uh, for example, in the positive element, allometry is more of the chip and negative allometry uh, more at the base and then here you can distribute. And now you have to see if this is correct, then you have to find out what the, um, what the, the uh, red molecule is or the differentiation. Uh, but there are far too many of them. Uh, first thing that comes to the mind of a plant biologist is the hormones, because there are, you know, at least three to five very important hormones. Uh, there is no plant uh, biology that is not controlled by those five hormones, you know, oxygen, cytokinin, uh, uh, gibberellic acid, and, and two others. Uh, gibberellic acid has been traditionally uh, uh, linked to uh, maturity. So we did uh, measure the gibberellic acid in three different uh, uh, leaf types, but they have, all of them have very similar uh, distribution. That is more here and less here. So that doesn't really. But there are many genetic factors which have been, uh, you know, discovered in past uh, 10 years or so, uh, which induces, uh, expressed in different uh, stages and then does various things in, in leaf maturity. And to put them together, this is how it, it looks like. So this is a, a dimension of the leaf uh, growth. Young leaf, green is cell division, so cell division is going on, uh, you know, everywhere uh, here. And then uh, from the top, the cell division is cleared, so it's restricted here, restricted here, and after that, there's no cell division at all. As, uh, you know, Olivier was saying, that the majority of the leaf growth is actually contributed by the, by the cell, cell expansion. And uh, there are many group of genes, most of them are transcription factors, are expressed in different regions. So this is the cell proliferation zone, this is the cell expansion zone, and this overlapping zone is quite interesting because this is where you see both, you know, cell division and expansion happening in the same space. Uh, you know, certain genes are expressed here and control cell division. Certain genes are uh, control cell expansion, but, you know, some of them are rate, some of them are duration, and so on and so forth. But there is one group of uh, a gene which is uh, here, uh, uh, a module of microRNA and the target transcription factor that is uh, important in leaf morphogenesis. That expression also is quite important. The GRF actually stands for growth regulating factor. So they promote growth. And if you see the expression of, a, uh, of the GRF, uh, uh, these genes, uh, these are, you know, code for encode transcription factors. If you see their expression pattern, so what you are seeing is the top view of a very young Arborosis uh, plant where this is a cotyledon and new leaves are coming up. You can see it has a gradient of expression pattern. These promote growth and they are more at the base. And we know that the Arborosis grows from the base. So actually, you know, uh, fits quite well. And so one, uh, you know, possibility would be that the GRF is expressed with different polarity in different kind of allometric, allometric leaves. So uh, that makes your uh, job easy because you see the GRF expression pattern in, in, in different uh, uh, allometric leaves and then see what the pattern is. 
but uh, I mean, as most uh, important genes come as a family and not a single, GRF also has, in albidopsis there are eight of them or nine of them. So it's very difficult to do that in the tree species because the, the, the sequence information is not known. But thankfully, uh, most of these GRFs, if not all, in arabidopsis are controlled by a single microRNA, MIR390. Right? So this inhibits that, right? If this inhibits that, then what is the expression pattern of microRNA? And there's a single one which makes our job easy. Uh, so if you see the expression pattern, again, it has a sort of complementary expression pattern. There is a more GRF, uh, MIR319 at the tip, and uh, you know, progressively less. And as the leaf matures, you can see this is a young leaf, younger than this one. Uh, its uh, expression is at, at the very tip, and then it will start spreading, and then when the leaf is mature, it will be all over the all over the leaf. And this expression pattern is actually making the pattern of this uh, of the target because because it is there, it is it is not there. So you don't have to uh, chase the GRF expression pattern. Now you can chase microRNA expression pattern. MicroRNAs are also useful because they are conserved. They are about 21, 22 nucleotide long, and they're conserved from moss to all the way to, uh, you know, higher uh, plants like Arabidopsis or anthrax. You can use the Arabidopsis sequence to probe and then see what is the expression polarity of the MIR396 in various uh, uh, species. You do that, um, the expression pattern of this one. in. Uh, a representative species, which is a positive allometry, in, in this case, tecoma. You can see the cells are dividing here and then mature here. You take a representative species from negative allometry, proton, which I described later, where the maturity is here and then the maturity is there. And you take another one where uh, there is no polarity at all, which is bohenia in this case, where the cell size is there. And then see, what you do is you cut a young leaf at the top half and the bottom half, and then uh, do a smaller and northern and then see where the microRNA is more, uh, whether at the chip or at the base. Remember that in Arabidopsis, which grows po with positive allometry, uh, the GRF is more here and then uh, MIR396, uh, which is a maturity inducing mRNA, is more at the chip. So if you do the, this, uh, you know, the, this experiment, uh, the, the MIR396 is more at the chip in this leaf than at the base, which is not surprising because that is the case in Arabidopsis as well. Wherever there is maturity, there is, uh, there is more MIR. And this is the loading control in six. Uh, whereas uh, the leaf with the negative allometry, where the maturity is at the base, there is more microRNA, which is opposite of this one. And here there is no difference in the in the growth in the chip of the half, and then there is no difference in, in the amount of the microRNA as well. So one argument. Uh, so we can say that the, the uh, uh, this probably generates the allometry. The, the distribution uh, of uh, MIR and is actually generates the allometry. But uh, you can argue that MIR396 GRF uh, relationship, which has been studied in Arabidopsis, may not hold true for other species. You know, the GRFs may not be the target of the, of the uh, MIR396 in other species. So what you do is you isolate at least one, uh, you know, GRF-like uh, GRF genes from all these species, which is for which the sequence information is not known, clone them, and then see their distribution here. For example, uh, in this case, which is uh, Tacoma stands GRF2, which has been isolated, wherever there is more microRNA, there is less target. Wherever there is less microRNA, there is more target. So the relationship holds true, not only for the positive allometry, but for the negative allometry as well. There's less microRNA, more here, more microRNA, less here, and here it is equal distribution. And these are the uh, loading control. Even for them also, the sequence information is not known. So we have to isolate those genes, homologous genes, and the, uh, do that. So, there's a strong correlation, but there is this another freak, you no know, weird leaf which has mixed allometry. Uh, so here, what you know, what is the expected expression uh, uh, polarity of the of the MIR396? Here you can't cut into half, so you cut into uh, you know three thirds, tip mid and base, and you see that is more microRNA here, more microRNA here, and less of the tip. So in all you know four different groups, there is a strong correlation. So if you Sort of put them together in a summary. Uh, positive allometry, there is more cell division here and more growth here. And this blue color is the cell differentiation and MIR396. And not only more growth and cell division here, the GRF is also more here. So they all sort of go together. Wherever, the, wherever, there, is, wherever there is more growth, there is more uh, cell division. So, uh, which has been shown in Arabidopsis that the growth and 
uh, cell division is uh, you know correlated it's there in other uh, species as well so it's a general factor that in all the species the growth is driven mostly by cell division and not by expression for example drosophila so there's this morphogen gradient in terms of bicoid which comes and really sets the polarity of the, in the, in the should i think of it like that uh, um i'll come to that i'll come to that so uh, uh, so um, yes i think i mean you can okay then what sets the initial in in there it's the maternal rna which sets right. uh, we don't know we don't even know what is the see the, all the uh, the analysis that has been done here uh, the leaf is pretty big already right so we are actually uh, following the later uh, growth rather than the early growth we don't know the expression pattern of this in the early stage do they start at the same allometry and then diverge or so yeah i mean we don't know this but but given this pattern uh, can i still go through and think of it like a french flag model where there is a morphogen gradient and the cells read that morphogen gradients and so go into different differentiated states yeah uh, uh, and affects growth yes and affects uh, and, yeah but, and affects you don't see any domain i mean sure sure but the growth rate growth rate is the readout of the and and see these is readout of the growth is comes from the from the uh, probably the concentration rate. exactly and these molecules can diffuse around throughout the uh, so that again is not known microRNAs are known to diffuse but not uh, this kind of distance Right, few cells. In other species, it has been shown in plant microRNAs can move, but few cells. So I'm not sure that the, the these uh, molecules will. So this pattern probably will be uh, will be made by their promoter or expression pattern. Okay, 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 way. okay. It's really an expression pattern rather than a pattern which comes. Yeah, that's what I think. Yeah. How is the initial pattern of miRNA expression itself set up? is that constraint you know you, are you starting with say a mechanical force that's triggering gene expression for the mirna because you know if you just go earlier and earlier you still have to set up this gradient and it's un, it's not like a morphogen which where you can produce and create a gradient very easily so it's curious to think of how you get the gradient in the first place yeah um uh, okay the answer is i don't know but i can uh, you know i can give some hand over so when the leaf is initiated um, in the meristem, which uh, you know Olivier uh, explained and uh, I also showed, uh, on the meristem, uh, the uh, there is a morphogen which is auxin is uh, local in uh, is is pushed and uh, a convergent point, you know by reorienting some uh, auxin transporters, which is essentially homologs of uh, amino acid transporters, and then you make an auxin maxima at, at one tip. And that is uh, the site of the leaf initiation, and at the tip has the maximum oxygen concentration. So that uh, is the trigger, uh, you know, for uh, uh, inducing uh, mir 396 is something. I don't know. So that's one. Thing. But that's very early stage what we are studying. So uh, now the question is, uh, is it a cause or effect? And that you can test by somebody was asking there by if you can change the expression pattern in a leaf where uh, you have, uh, you know, uh, you know the expression pattern and then try to modify that one, which is amenable to molecular changes. And arvidopsis, of course, is, is one of them which you can, is amenable to molecular changes. In, in arvidopsis, as I had shown before, is uh, MIR396 has uh, expression gradient maximum here and, and minimum here. And uh, one, uh, you know, X, Y, Z promoter, which has more expression pattern at the base and the, uh, less at the tip, which is opposite. So what you can do is you can clone this uh, uh, in, under the promoter of uh, this one and uh, express and then see what, what happens. So what happens here? More growth here, less growth here. This is a positive allometry. What you are saying is you are not really interfering with the endogenous ex expression pattern of this maturity inducing microRNA but you are expressing the microRNA here. So probably you are making the gradient shallower or you are trying to make it you know, more homogeneous or the isometric and then see what, what, what happens. Of course, you can soak up this microRNA also and then make it a more stronger uh, uh, one. But at the first step, what you have done is the differentiation is induced here at the wild type. You don't interfere with that. What you are doing is you are expressing in this region uh, artificially and then see, see what happens. 
So this is a wild type plant where uh, D cyclin is shown just to so show where the cell division is going on. There's a young leaf and the, as the leaf matures, you see that the cell division is restricted at the base, which you have seen earlier with the B cyclin as well. But if you do the similar study in a plant where microRNA has been by force expressed at the base, you see that initially there is not much change really, but later on uh, it, the D cyclin is cleared out from the base. So does it mean that the cell division has stopped there or not? Don't know. You just take compare these two and uh, what you see here that there's not much difference at the top because that's where nothing has been done at the top. What has been done is the base and that's where the maximum uh, difference is in the D cyclin. But you don't really see much difference in uh, you know, too much. There is still more cell division here than here. So you haven't really changed from one allometry to another allometry. But what you have done is if you take a closer look at the cell size, which is a marker of the cell division, here, here, and here, you see there is some difference between, between the, uh, uh, between the uh, wild type and the, and the transient. So what you do is you measure the cell, the cell size here, which is again as a marker of the, uh, of the maturity, here and here, and the compare here with this. So this is the, the leaf length or the developmental stages, small leaf and big leaf are growing, and this is the cell area. So in the black is the wild type. Uh, as the leaf grows, the cell size increases. Even in the transgenic also it increases, pretty similar. There's not much change. So basically the maturity here and here in the transgenic and wild type hasn't really changed because you haven't done anything there. But at the base where you have, uh, you have made the, the changes, that is you have uh, uh, expressed the microRNA, you see there's a larger difference. Initially it is not, but at least at a later stage, the transgenic, uh, the cell size increases at a faster rate compared to the wild type. So maturity is to some extent uh, advanced at the base and to some extent at the middle as well. And so you haven't, and aerodopsis is really, really small. You can't measure the alpha value because you have to put a dot here and then measure and all. It's very difficult to, to do that. So it's uh, impossible to measure the alpha value for aerodopsis. But what you have done is you have uh, changed at least some parameters, that is uh, the polarity of the D cyclin expression and the, the cell, uh, cell size, which is a measure of the uh, of, of differentiation, change a little bit by, uh, uh, by artificially expressing the MIR396 at the base. If you take the ratio of the uh, these two cells here, here, and here, that is the ratio of the wild type and this one, it is same uh, at the tip, it doesn't change, but at the base it changes and at the mid also it changes towards the later. So it is, uh, the cells are maturing at a faster rate. So I think I'll stop here most likely. So uh, to conclude that the growth polarity is possibly regulated by MIR 396, uh, you know, we'll be able to tell it with more certainty if you, we can actually change the alpha value uh, upside down. Um, and uh, today I'll stop here and then I'll just ask my students to thank me because I'm you know, presenting their work on their behalf. And uh, this is the student who actually all this work. And uh, I'll take questions if I Right, so uh, the question is, is there the growth condition changes allometry or not? Uh, we have, so these are all wild plants, right? And we have uh, measured them. So some of the species are um, uh, deciduous. So in winter, all the leaves grow and then always the leaf comes in the, grows in the uh, spring. Uh, so there we can't answer your question. But there are many others which are evergreen and uh, they keep growing throughout the year. And we have actually done throughout the year. It doesn't really uh, change allometry. I don't know the extent of allometry changes, but the polarity does not change, definitely. We also uh, measured the alpha value in different geographical areas within the country, of course. The same species, you know, the south of India and the north of India. As long as it's the same species, it doesn't really change. So, probably not. Uh, even, you know, in a tree, different leaves, are getting different level of, uh, you know, uh, environmental cues. For example, the top leaves get more light and the middle. Leaves. So even there also, you don't really see. So it's probably more genetic than, than environment. 
I'm going to talk a little bit about this tomorrow. Uh, actually, I, I was hesitating, but after your talk, I think I should uh, talk about it. Uh, so there is differential growth in the in the leaf, uh, as, as you mentioned, and this is going to generate mechanical conflicts mm -hmm. between the different zones. And what we see is that the max tubules are aligning with this. So this has uh, consequences on the shape in the end. But the conflict will not be there in one class of allometry or? Exactly, so in the isometric one, I would expect no uh, mechanical conflict. Yeah. Uh, I have a very similar question, like uh, you said the GRFs, they promote growth, right? So when we are... I mean cell division. Uh, cell division, yeah. So when we overexpress the microRNA at the base, what I would expect is even the shape changes because the growth is inhibited. But uh, in your experiment, the shape didn't change and doesn't seem like only the growth dynamics has changed, but growth per se hasn't changed. It's a very mild effect that uh, we have got. I think uh, uh, so, uh, I mean, we have expressed other factors, you know, in different regions, which, you know, either suppress growth or something like that. We see the overall shape remains same. Okay, so one possibility is, uh, you know, when you are expressing or the effect of the gene or you know the promoter that we are cloning, they are probably have a later effect and not very early effect. I don't know, but there are minor changes in the uh, in, in their expression pattern uh, in the shape. For example, if we express at the base, the base becomes in a little bit narrower and down. But I think these gene uh, misexpression does not have uh, major changes in the in the overall shape. So that probably is controlled by you know, decided very early on. In the, the Any more questions? Okay. So thank you, Panath, for the wonderful talk. <laughs>